Well, I'm genuinely excited to welcome my next guest into the wind tunnel because he is a classic example. And I think inspiration for anybody that as a youngster has a dream and then is able through commitment and hard work to fulfill it. He started in Vermont of all places, home of the Thunder Road. And at the time, that's some of the best racing you would have ever seen on a short track. Tom Curley was in charge and he was a master promoter, but I, I digress from my guest from there. You now hear him in the turns in motor racing networks, coverage of cup racing, Xfinity racing, truck racing, and God knows what else I'm talking about Dave Moody. who joins me now, Dave. Uh, I, I really do appreciate this. And uh, I hope that you're doing well. I'm doing fantastically, Jackie. Anything for you, my friend, when, when anybody that goes back as far as we go back, right? We're happy to spend time together. But let's go back, shall we? Uh, as I alluded to, uh, you, like me, had an objective. And you had to work hard, and you started at the very bottom. Tell my listeners a little bit about that story. Well, I mean, my uncle took me to my first stock car race at five, maybe six years old at, yes, the nation's site of excitement, Thunder Road, International Speedball, <laughs> high atop Corey Hill and Barry, tickets still available. That's, you know, the line right out of Ken Squire's mouth. He owned the track at the time. And from that first day, I, my, my uncle asked me who I thought was going to win. And I picked my car and that car won the heat, the semi feature and the feature. And it ruined me to ever do <laughs> anything else in the world. And and from that day on, Jackie, I wanted to find a way to be at the racetrack and be around the racers and, you know, between public address announcing and writing for the local newspaper and then writing for the weekly trade papers and, and then going to work for MRN and then eventually on Sirius XM uh, satellite radio, I've always found a way to stay within arm's reach of the sport. Tell me a little bit, because I, I've been over the course of the last couple of episodes sharing stories of my career. Uh, and a couple of episodes ago, I explained how I ended up with ABC Sports. So my question to you, Dave, is how did you end up at MRN? Ken Squire. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, as so many in, you know, people ask sometimes, why are so many NASCAR announcers from New England? And a lot of us trace that path directly back to Ken Squire. I was, you know, when he got busy with CBS, he kind of grabbed me by the shoulder and said, listen, I need somebody to fill in on the track PA system and you're going to be it. And, and taught me half of what he knows and all of what I know. And, and at some point, and I don't know why, because it was not in his best interest to recommend me for any better jobs. He could have kept me right there at home working for him. But at some point, he told our, our dear friend, John McMullen, who was running MRN at the time. You who, know, by the way, looking, a graduate of Stafford Speedway. That's right. That's yeah. right. Not, you know, <laughs> not that we're looking to plug, but yes. So, and he basically, he basically told McMullen, if you're looking for any new blood, I got a kid up here that isn't, you know, terrible if you want to give him a listen. And they brought me down to Daytona and they auditioned me. And it's, you know, it's either been uphill or downhill since, depending on your point of view. Well, look, everybody recognizes your voice and you, along with Bagman and the anchor booth, uh, have been doing this for quite some time. So I'm assuming that you've got a lot of vivid memories of your career. And we'll get to Speedway in a second. But your MRN career, anything you want to share that maybe heretofore people didn't know? Well, there have been some amazing days. There's no doubt about that. The, the, first, the first time I ever worked the Daytona 500 in a turn, one time they sent me down to the garage to interview the people that had blown up. And I don't think anybody blew up the whole day. So I, I don't think I even made it to air. But the first time they put me in a turn, I was calling turn three and four for the first Daytona 500 was the day Daryl Waltrip won the race. And if you'll recall, they went approximately 400 miles on a tank of gas at the end of that thing. I mean, they were drafting seagulls down the back straightaway <laughs> trying to make it. And, 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 you know, for a kid out of Vermont, 
scared to death still. I hadn't done more than five or six MRN broadcasts in total to be doing the Daytona 500 and calling Daryl Walter home to the checkered flag. That was that was pretty cool. And I got to tell you, the the day that my friend Ricky Craven went to Cup Series Victory Lane for the first time was pretty neat, too, because I remember him as about a 15-year-old kid at the Unity Raceway in Maine with buck teeth and red hair flying everywhere and a fire suit that was so, ho- so old the seat of the pants had been missing for about 10 years, saying to, to Tom Curley, who ran the American Canadian Tour at that time, Mr. Curley, my name is Ricky Craven, and I hope to be good enough someday to race on your tour. Well, he sure did that, and he went a lot further than that. So calling him home in a cup race for the first time was pretty neat, too. All right. People hear you now five days a week. You you have been right from the beginning of Sirius XM Radio's coverage of NASCAR. I, I like to say the foundation and the anchor with, with your show, Sirius XM Speedway. It, it to me is fascinating because y- you, I think, like me, enjoy mixing a little humor, but mm-hmm. you also love your listeners and you provide them with some insight. Uh, but sometimes I feel like uh, you're herding cats on that show. Yes, and, and happily so. Mm-hmm. Um, y- you know, it, it's the basic tenet of sports talk radio people with opinions sometimes you're going to agree with those opinions sometimes you're not going to agree with those uh, opinions the only real rules i have is don't insult people don't use profanity and while you're entitled to your opinion there's only one set of facts so if you if you come to the dance have your facts together because if you if you try and push something out there that isn't true the host is going to say hold on a minute that's not necessarily the case but other than that man i love listening to people's opinions i never learned anything by talking i learned by listening and we we probably talk to as many nascar fans in a week as anybody else on the planet and i wear that as a badge of honor how educated do you think thanks to Sirius XM nascar race fans have become I like to think that we've raised the bar um, and, and we certainly haven't done it alone, Jackie. I mean, you know, social media in general, as big as uh, a big a pain in the rump as it can be sometimes, uh, because it does make everybody feel like an expert, whether they are or not. Social media has allowed people and given them access to information and insight and driver interviews and stats and figures that they were never privy to before you know when when i was a kid the the biggest education i got was on friday when my speedway scene newspaper landed in the mailbox and i could find out who won at stafford and thompson and rockford and all over the country and i had to wait a week to find out who won last week now you don't have to wait 15 minutes it's all right there and i think it's been very good overall uh, to to educate our our fan base Look, in every sport, there are journalists, writers, broadcasters that create an uncommon bond between themselves and the athlete. You certainly, along with your counterparts, uh, have been very, very successful at that with a NASCAR community that really has got a lot on their mind when you're down there visiting. Um, you, You talk about the ability to listen, but there is a, a certain level of empathy that gives them the, I guess, the safety to be able to let you or your counterparts into the inner circle. How, how, how does that happen? I think part of it is just longevity. You know, when, uh, when, when you've been there for going on to 30 years, well, more than 30 years, as, as I have been kicking around the garage at event, at a certain point, they, they recognized you and, and say, okay, he's been here as long as I have, he must be doing something right. And the other part of it, Jackie, is something that I learned from the late, great Barney Hall a long time ago. And that is that you don't necessarily have to talk about everything you know. Barney was one of the great power brokers in the history of the sport. He knew who was losing their ride at the end of the season. He knew who was looking for a driver at the end of the season. He knew who had a sponsor and who didn't. And a lot of times, very quietly behind the scenes, he would match people up. He knew a lot of stories. 
and most of them never made it out of his mouth because he he understood and that 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 confidence was was something that took you years to build and could take you seconds to lose and one of the things he told me that I've never forgotten he said before you open your mouth ask yourself two questions does this need to be said and does this need to be said by me and if the answer to either one of those questions is no keep your mouth shut and that has saved my bacon more times than I can count over the years <laughs> Yeah, I got a lot of great advice from Barney as well. Look, there's been some news in the NASCAR world over the course of the last couple of weeks, and it involves Roush Racing and Brad Keselowski. And, and um, you've you've been on top of it. Now, we should establish that, well, shall we put it, it hasn't been confirmed, but back channels have confirmed it. So let's go on the premise that it is going to happen, that following in the business model that Tony Stewart and, and Gene Haas created, that Keselowski is going to move over to Roush, still drive, but have a, an ownership interest in the race. I mean, in the car. <clears throat> Excuse me. Are we seeing the beginning in your, your mind with the introduction of the Gen 7 next year more and more of those type of relationships coming across the newswire? I think it's impossible to ignore. It's either, it's either a direct correlation or the biggest coincidence in the history of the sport that Denny Hamlin has decided to become a, a, a team owner and bring, on, bring in somebody like Michael Jordan, that Justin Marks, after years of saying, boy, I'd love to, but I just, I just can't make the business model work, is here with Pitbull as a, as a sponsor. You know, Matt Tift and BJ McLeod have taken the dive to go cup racing. Dale Jr. and Kelly Earnhardt Miller, after years of saying absolutely not, are giving some serious thought to cup. We're now seeing Brad Keselowski want to get into ownership. The, the fact, Jackie, that the business model five years from now may actually make some financial sense for anybody other than the criminally insane that just love <laughs> racing so much that they don't care how much money they lose. Yeah, I, I think that's got to be a huge factor in, in all of these decisions happening at roughly the same time. Look, you, you've uh, been you've played in the past uh, the owner role in mm -hmm. some late models. So before I let you go. You know, with the incredible amount of money that you make, maybe, just maybe, we could see Dave Moody uh, field a cup car. I'm a Powerball ticket away, Jackie, and that's the only <laughs> Because, as you well know, you've worked for MRN, and you've worked for Sirius XM. So you, you know that, that I'm, I'm in beans and weenies territory, which is not exactly Cup Series owner territory. I'll just sit back here on the sidelines, broadcast the race, and get excited for who wins, and get sad for who loses and crashes and you know, tears up race cars. That's all I need anymore. That's enough. And, and I know what you'll continue to do is take your passion and transmit it to race fans because at that – early age of five years old, you were uh, administered the drug that has no cure. That's and right. That is That's the right. world. That is the world of auto racing. Dave, it's always a pleasure. Continued uh, good fortune. And uh, we'll catch up down the road. Okay. Anytime, my friend, keep up the good work. Always a pleasure to see you.